So this is now where we get on to the newer uh, applications of integrals. We did the area in between two curves, which really wasn't all that different from doing just the area under one curve. And so average value is our first application, um, first of four, I believe. And it starts off really similar to something that we've been doing for a very, very long time, which is just taking averages. You know, like if I were to add up all of your test scores and divide them by however many of you there are, it would give me your average test score, the mean test score. And so when we're taking the average value of a function, it's a very, very similar idea to that. The only issue is that when you're talking about a function, you've got an infinite number of values. Whereas when you're taking just the average of something, you're taking the average of a finite number of values. So like I said, we're still going to use the same principles, but you will see what happens when we're looking at something infinite rather than something finite. Because obviously you can't divide by infinity. So let's take a look at this first very, very uh, almost silly example. So taking the average of a finite group of numbers looks like this. You know, we've got five values here. You literally are just going to take them all, add them together. and then divide uh, however many there are, which there are five, and so we add them all up and divide by five. Um, when we do that, this one for example, we end up with 59.8. Okay, I'm not gonna take the time to plug that in my calculator and show you, I'm assuming you believe me. But like I said, what we're trying to take here is the average value of a function. And with a function, you've got an infinite number of values, and you can't just divide by infinity. So we're actually gonna take it back to Riemann sums for just a, a brief moment here. Um, because Riemann sums are something that are finite, whereas an actual integral is something that is infinite. Okay, so if we talk about Riemann sums, let's say we've got a continuous function, of course, on a closed interval from A to B, um, and let's talk about the formula for the right Riemann sum. All right, it looks like this. So n is however many intervals we divide it up into. So for each one of them, each one of the rectangles, the width is going to be B minus A divided by n, and so since we're assuming these are all equal interval rectangles, we can just put the width on the outside since they're all just going to multiply by that width anyway. So B minus A is the width of the whole interval from A to B. And then if we're cutting it up into N subintervals, this would be the width of each rectangle. And then, like I said, rather than doing individual rectangles, I'm just going to add up all the heights in here. So we would do the first function value. All right, and then plus the second function value, however many there are, we add them all together until we hit the n function value. Okay, so what these represent is the height, the height of each individual rectangle, and then this represents the width of each individual rectangle. Since all the widths are the same, I just kind of factored it out and put it out front here. Okay, so that's our formula. Um, so remember, heights are given by function values since we're talking about f of x, a continuous function. So this is the Riemann sum formula, maybe a little more generic than we've ever really seen it before. But all right, so our next step, our next step, we are going to divide both sides by the quantity b minus a. All right, to get rid of this quantity b minus a right here, because everything else is in terms of x and n, and we've just got way too many things going on. So we're going to divide both sides by b minus a, which remember is the width of the overall interval. So we will have a 1 over b minus a on the left times whatever the total of the Riemann sum is, and then equals, and now I'm going to reformat this right-hand side slightly. I'm going to take this whole thing and put it over the n. I think I used a capital N before, sorry. Okay, so now hopefully you see the parallels between this one with the finite number. This one is a finite number of rectangles, and so it looks very, very, very similar to this. So to approximate the average value of the function, we would take n Riemann sums, add up all the heights, divide by n, which is the number of Riemann sums, and it would be equal to this. The total Riemann sum times 1 over b minus a. All right. Of course, though, we know what happened to Riemann sums. We started talking about, well, what happens if we take more rectangles and more rectangles, and eventually this n will go towards infinity. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. And so as we take n to infinity, 
you get more and more rectangles. The width of the rectangle will shrink down to almost nothing. And the Riemann sum looks just like the actual integral. All right, so like it says here, if we take n to infinity, the Riemann sum ends up being just the average, I'm sorry, the, uh, the definite integral. All right, so if you're looking for this, this is the quote-unquote average value that we're talking about if we only use a finite number of sums, and we said it was equal to this. And so taking this quantity right here, like I said, as n approaches infinity, this is something we talked about when we first introduced Riemann sums. As n approaches infinity, this value gets closer and closer to the actual value of the definite integral. All right, so this is our average value formula. So what this basically does is it sums up every single one of the infinite function values. And then you divide by the length of the interval, which is essentially like dividing by the total number of values. So it is very similar, actually, to what a normal average formula looks like. All right, so this is something you should have memorized. It's not all that difficult. You know what a definite integral looks like, and then you just divide it by the width of the interval. All right, quick little graphical interpretation for you. Let's look at just a very basic function, y equals x. And so let's, let's go to like 3. So of course, 3 on the x-axis is 3 on the y-axis. So if we want to know what is the average value of this function on the interval from 0 to 3. All right, so hopefully, since we started off with such a basic idea, basic function, just y equals x. Hopefully you could pick out that, it's like right here, this is the point 33. So we start at the point 00, zero goes up to the point 33. Basically what you'd try to do is add up every single one of the y values, which you, you can't, you couldn't possibly do that. But hopefully you'd see that with this nice linear function here, they would average out to the middle value, which is just a one and a half. So the graphical interpretation looks something like this. First of all, you'd do one third times the integral of x from 0 to 3. Okay, and it looks like this. One third, the antiderivative of x is one half x squared, and then we evaluate that from zero to three. So we've got one sixth x squared. So one sixth times nine is nine sixths, or three halves, and then minus zero. So like I said, it does end up being three halves, or one and a half, which is right at that middle value. What the graphical interpretation says is, all right, sure, take that one and a half, mark it on your axis right here, I'm going to use a different color just so you get a nice little visual. And that was not quite halfway. If it was halfway, this would be a much better graphical interpretation. Um, but what this says is if you take this pink area right here, which is just a horizontal line with the average value as the height, and compare it to the area under the curve, it would actually end up being the exact same area. Okay, so if you're looking at the area under the function, it's the same as the area of a rectangle with the average value as its height. So 1.5 is that right there. So when we say average it out, and I call this, we can talk about this more in class, um, we call this the freeze and thaw theorem. So picture if my function froze like this, the blue function. If it froze like this, and remember, what we do is a lot of theoretical math. So yes, I know that the density of ice and water is different, but just humor me here. Um, let's pretend that this blue one is the frozen version. The average value would be, all right, take that frozen function out of the freezer and let it thaw. What would it level out to? And it would level out to this pink rectangle right here, and that's your average value. The highs kind of fill in the lows, and it all levels out. The hills fill in the valleys, however you want to think about it. All right, um, so let's get into some actual computational type problems now that we know the theory. Example one, we want to find the average value, so we're just using that formula that we've got right here. So from 0 to 3 means we start with a 1 over 3 minus 0, which of course we know is just 1 third, and then the integral from 0 to 3, and then we just plug in our function f of x. Okay, and so we find the average value. 
we are going to compute this. We've got one third, and then when I take the antiderivative of this, I've got 4x minus one third x cubed, and I'm going to evaluate that from 0 to 3. Okay, so first I'm going to plug in the 3. And so I've got one third, when I plug in the 3, I get 12 minus one third of 27, which is 9, and then just minus 0 when I plug in the 0. I'm doing this pretty quickly because I'm assuming that our integration skills are probably strong by now. So 12 minus 9, of course, is 3. 3 times a third is 1. And so it says that the average value is 1. Does f actually take on this value at some point during the interval? Well, let's find out. Okay, so the graph 4 minus x squared, it's got a y-intercept of 4, x-intercepts of 2 and negative 2, so my graph looks like this. Okay, and then it says, does f actually take on this value at some point? Well, of course it does. So here's 1. We look, it takes it on right there. All right, so that is our average value. Yes, it does take on our value at some point during the interval. The reason that I bring that up, the reason that we started looking for the average value and questioning, does a function actually take on its average value, is because that's going to lead us right into... Uh, Da, 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 da. Mean value theorem for integrals. So since f is continuous, that part is important. If it wasn't continuous, this wouldn't work. Um, what this says is it does take on its average value. As long as the function is continuous, it's going to take on its average value somewhere. And it's a similar idea to the mean value theorem for derivatives. Now it's the mean value theorem for integrals. And so the mean value theorem says as long as f is continuous, there exists a value c somewhere on this interval, such that, and it's very, very similar to what we just did with that previous problem, such that f of c is equal to the average value. Okay, and then, um, this is definitely an error on my part, had a graphical interpretation that could just be the very same graphical interpretation that we had on the previous page. Let me just kind of tweak it around a little bit. So I'm going to start with this, this guy right here. I'm going to multiply by this quantity, b minus a. All right, so it's going to look like this. And then I'm just going to copy down, actually, might as well just display the same graphical interpretation that I was just looking at. So this right here, this side, is the area of a rectangle. While as this side, of course, we know what a direct, or I'm sorry, a definite integral is. This is the area under the curve. So this is saying just what I said with that other graphical interpretation picture. The area of a rectangle with the width of the interval and the height of the average value, that area ends up being the same as the area under the curve. And I'm going to flash this picture just to remind you. So the area under the curve is the blue area, and it's the exact same area as the pink rectangle, which is a rectangle with a B minus A width and a 1.5 height, which is the average value. And then you can always think about that whole freeze and thaw idea as well. Okay, couple more examples to do in the video here. Example two, what is the average area of the circles whose radii vary from zero to one? So let's start with the area formula for area of a circle. Pi r squared. And then if we want to take the average area, so zero to one are the bounds. So you do one over one minus zero, and then the area from zero to one, and then you just use your area formula. So pi r squared, and this is going to be a dr. You just match the differential to whatever your variable is. If it's, you know, x's, it's dx. If they are t's, it's dt. Okay, so we set that up. And then we know the way the calculus works from here. We are going to, first of all, just kind of ignore that. That's a 1 over 1, which is 1. I don't need to write it. We take the antiderivative of this. Remember, pi is just a constant. So when I take the antiderivative of r squared, it goes to 1 third r cubed and then I'm evaluating it from 0 to 1. So r cubed, when I plug in 1, 
is just 1. So I get pi over 3 minus 0, which of course ends up being pi over 3. So all the circles whose radii vary from 0 to 1, there's an infinite number of possibilities there, but the average value of the area would be pi over 3. All right, and we did that using an integral in the average value formula. Okay, last problem here. This is an interpretation of the mean value theorem for integrals. It says let m be the average value on this, so let's find it first. So 1 over 2 minus 0, that's the width of the interval, times the integral from 0 to 2, and then we plug our function right in here. Let's find that first. So we've got a 1 half out front. The antiderivative of this is a 2 thirds x cubed, and then we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 2. Okay, so first of all, these are going to cancel, leaving me with a 1 third. And then I have 1 third times 2 cubed, which would be 8 thirds, and then minus 1 third times 0 cubed, which of course is 0. So my average value of this function on this interval is 8 thirds which if you're ever unsure of whether it actually does work, take a look at a picture. You'll see that if you're looking at the y values, it would make sense. They, yeah, sure, they would average out around 8 thirds. So last thing is to find a value of c, meaning an x value, such that f of c equals m. So we are going to take 2c squared. They use a c, so I'm going to use a c and we want to set it equal to 8 thirds, just to show that the mean value theorem does actually work, that there is in fact an x value that has a y value equal to the average value. I know I just said the word value many times. Let me walk you up through <laughs> and explain it. So it says there is an x value whose y value is equal to the average value of the function. So we found the average value of the function, we're just setting the function equal to solve for that value of c. All right, so a little bit of algebra, divide both sides by two, and then square root both sides. Keep in mind that when you square root, you should always have a plus or minus, and then you'll have two over the square root of three. You can rationalize it, you cannot rationalize it, whatever your preference is today, maybe it'll change tomorrow, I don't know. Um, and then keep in mind what our interval is. Our interval is just from zero to two, which means we're gonna choose the positive version. Okay, so two over root three, or for you rationalizers, two root three over three. All right, so that's it. We've got some AP problems that we're going to do in class together.